Hey, good morning, One Life Church. It is so good to be able to hang out with you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to continue our series called Circles. And I want to ask you to go ahead and turn your Bibles or use your device and go to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to be starting in verse 42. We'll be reading verses 42 through 47. While you turn there, I want to go ahead and just let the cat out of the bag. At the end of today's teaching, I'm going to invite you to be a part of a 242 group. These are um, our new groups that we're starting this fall. And even though you are joining us online and you are a part of our online um, church community, we are going to have 242 groups that meet online. And so you are going to have an opportunity to join one of those groups at the end of the teaching today. So let's read from Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. Luke is the author. Remember, he is continuing his story of the person of Jesus that is in the gospel according to Luke. And then he just turns the page and keeps writing about how this this way of Jesus is being played out in the first Christians, in the first church. And this is what we read in the book of Acts. Chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They, these first Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray together. Uh, God, thank you for your written word. We submit ourselves to your authority, to to your authority in our lives, to your authority in this world, your authority over all of creation. We submit to you and we ask God that you would speak to us today. That as we study your written word, that that God, that you would speak to us and you would show us how to live um, in line with you. And so we pray that you give us open ears to hear your voice above all the other noises in the world. I pray that you give us open eyes to see where you are already present and at work. And I pray that you give us open hearts, courageous hearts, to join with you in what you are up to. So we love you, God. We thank you for loving us first. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen and amen. Circles are better than rows. Circles are better than rows. This is a, a principle that was coined by Andy Stanley, a pastor in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And it's, it's a, a principle that we are unpacking and wrestling with um, during this series called Circles. And, and we're believing that we want to, to use this principle to intentionally inform our ministry philosophy here at One Life going forward. The reality is, is that you don't mature while sitting in rows. You don't mature sitting in rows. You, you mature while sitting in circles. You you don't grow. You don't grow in your faith. You don't grow in your relationships. You don't grow emotionally while sitting in rows, staring at the back of other people's heads. You You don't grow that way. You grow while sitting and operating and living in circles. We all want to grow. We all want to grow spiritually. We all want to grow in our relationship with Jesus. We all want to grow in our relationships with one another and those around us. And the way we do that is by operating and sitting in circles. Last week, we looked at the three circles that the early Christians lived in because they were following Jesus' example. If you didn't have a chance to watch last week's teaching, I want to encourage you to go back and, and watch that and listen to that. We talked about verses 46 and verses 47, and we looked at the three circles that the the early church operated in. And this is our language. They didn't use this language, but it's our language that we're using to help us remember and help us to orient our lives around these three environments, these three circles that the early Christians operated in. So let me do a quick review. They practiced an up circle or an up rhythm where they turned their attention and their adoration towards Jesus. 
It's the circle where Jesus is the host and we are the guests. It's the circle where we remember who Jesus is and what Jesus is up to in the world. It's the circle where we are reminded that because of the work of Jesus, we are now the family of God. They also practiced an in circle where they lived in relationship with one another or they lived in community with one another. They learned to love one another pray for one another, serve one another, carry one another's burdens, and they learned to forgive one another. It's a circle of hospitality where we invite one another to come as you are, your authentic self, and to sit at the table. It's the place where we remind one another, you belong here. And finally, they practiced an out circle where they lived on mission as the sent people of God, proclaiming the good news of Jesus to the world around them. They, they loved their enemies because Jesus first loved them. They, they remembered that there was a time when someone invited them to the table for the first time. And so they turn and they invite others to the table for the first time. These were the three circles, the three environments that the first church operated in. And therefore, as we as a church today, we want to follow their example and ultimately we want to follow the example of Jesus. Today we're going to talk about the second circle, the in circle. The circle where we learn to be our authentic self by living in community with one another. Let me go ahead and say this right up front. This is hard work. Living in the in circle, it it requires sacrifice. It requires a lot of courage on your part. It requires a whole lot of grace from each of us. Living in fellowship, in relationship with other people is hard. It's very messy. Uh, My wife and I, we have been doing our best to practice this in circle for many, many years. And I remember one time in particular where we, we had about 25 or 30 people in our home. And we had a meal together and we enjoyed one another's company and, and we talked about who God was and what God was doing in our lives. And I can remember that the night came to a close and And there was a new family that had come, and their girls, they loved orange soda. And we had a a two liter of orange soda. And and on their way out, they decided that they wanted to fill their red Solo cup to the brim with orange soda, which that was fine. That was great. And so they filled that, that, that red Solo cup all the way to the top with their favorite orange soda. And they're walking out of our house and we're giving hugs to each other and we're telling them bye and we're telling them that they're invited to come back the next time. And one of the little girls, she bends over to grab something of hers and when she does, she drops her red Solo cup straight onto the ground in our house. It hits the wood floor, bounces up in the air, and orange soda sprayed all over our yellow wall. There was orange soda everywhere. All over my kids' toys, all over our rug, all over the wall, and some on the ceiling. There was orange soda everywhere. Now, this is a metaphor. Because living life together is messy. Sometimes, Orange soda gets spilled all over the floor. And also, it's a metaphor that we all have a lot of orange soda that we bring to the table. We are messy people. And sometimes that splatters on the people around us. And so I just want to say this right up front, that this in circle is not easy. It requires risk, it requires sacrifice, it requires courage, and most of all, it requires grace. So how in the world do we do it? How do we do something that is so hard? I love that my wife tells my kids often, you can do hard things. 
You can do hard things. The question is how? How will you be able to live in community, in fellowship, in relationship with other people when you yourself are messy and the other people that you are living in community with are also messy? I think the first church left us an example to follow in verse 42. In verse 42, Luke writes that all of the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the sharing of meals, and to prayer. I think Luke leaves us an example for how to do hard things, how to live in community with one another, especially because we are so messy. When the first church would gather, they would do four things. Let's walk through these four things. Number one, they would would study the apostles' teachings. For this first group of Christians, this meant that they would discuss the teachings of Jesus given to them by the first apostles. The, The first apostles at this moment when Luke is writing this were the first 12 disciples that we read of in the Gospels minus Judas. The group of people, this, these 11 men, they walked with Jesus. This group of people, were they, they were teaching the first Christians the words and the works and the ways of Jesus. And so when this first group of Christians would gather, they would practice, and when they practiced their version of the in circle, they would study, they would discuss, They would debate, and they would wrestle with the apostles' teaching. For us today, we have have the whole Bible. And so for us today, the apostles' teaching isn't just the teachings of Jesus that we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it's also the, the, the letters of Paul and the letters of John and the letters of Peter. And, and Hebrews, and, and even the Old Testament, that we get together and we wrestle with these teachings. We wrestle with the written Word of God. The second thing they would do is they would practice fellowship. We're going to get into this more next week. okay? But Christian fellowship isn't just about hanging out with other Christians. It's actually more than that. It's actually about unity. It's it's described in verses 44 and 45 of Acts 2 when Luke writes, all the believers were together and had everything in common. This is to describe fellowship. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. It's the practice. Fellowship, Christian fellowship is the practice of becoming of one purpose. Paul describes it like this in Philippians chapter 2. We read this quite often. Paul writes, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. This is Christian fellowship. And we're going to come back to that next Sunday. Next, these first Christians, they would practice the sharing of meals. We say this a lot here at One Life. Something heavenly happens around the table. Something Heavenly, miraculous happens when we share meals. Once again, we see that this group of disciples of Jesus in Acts, they were simply following the example of Jesus. If you look at the four Gospels, you read that Jesus over and over and over again could be found sitting around a table eating a meal. For Jesus, this was a practice This was a way to bring heaven to earth. 
It's a place where we all have a seat, where we look at each other, where we see each other, where we share with each other. None of us comes open-handed, but we come to the table willing to share something. It's the place where we are reminded that we are all on the same level. It's the place where we sit shoulder to shoulder, rubbing elbows with one another. It's the place where we enjoy good food and good drink and remember that God is the provider of all things. This practice of sharing meals It also, for the first Christians, included what we call the Lord's Supper, what we call communion or the Eucharist. During these meals, they would proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as their only hope. They would break the bread and they would remember that Jesus gave His body as a gift to them. They would drink from the cup and they would remember that Jesus' blood provided the forgiveness of sin. Something heavenly would happen around those tables. And that is still true for us today. Finally, this first group of Christians, they would pray. They would pray for one another. They would pray for their enemies. They would pray for healing. They would pray for their friends who didn't know Jesus as their Savior. They would pray for those who were trying to eradicate the way of Jesus. They would pray the Psalms. They would pray prayers of thanksgiving. They would pray prayers of joy. They would pray prayers of lament. They believed that God willingly turns His ear toward His people. That God hears the prayers of His people and that God answers those prayers. They believed that prayer was their primary and foundational form of worship. Now, why did these Christians practice these four things? Because living in community with one another is messy. It's hard work. And these four things, these four things help them do two things. Number one, it reminded them that, when, that we can live in community with one another only when we stay focused on Jesus. Studying the apostles' teachings, fellowship with one another, eating meals, and prayer. It reminded these early Christians, and it reminds us today, that we can only live in community, which is hard and messy and risky. We can only live in community with one another when we stay focused on Jesus. Or as the author of Hebrews says, when we fix our eyes on Jesus. That's it. That's the way that we live in the middle of the mess. We live in the middle of the mess by keeping our eyes fixed on the One that set the example for us. He is the lighthouse. In the middle of the storm, we keep our eyes fixed on Him. When the first church would study the apostles' teaching, they would remember what Jesus did for each one of them, and then they were inspired to extend that same love to those around them. When the first church would remember that Jesus invited them into fellowship with Him, they were inspired to live in fellowship with one another. When the first church would remember that Jesus invited them to a meal, they were inspired to invite others to a meal. And when the first church would remember that Jesus prayed for them, which is mind-blowing, but that Jesus prayed for them, they were inspired to pray for one another. And so the early church kept their eyes fixed on Jesus and followed His example. There's one more thing that I think that these four things, studying the apostles' teachings, fellowship, sharing meals and prayer, these four things communicate to us about practicing the end circle. And it's this, that none of these four things are quick fixes. In order for us to live in community with one another, we must be committed 
to obedience, long obedience in the same direction. Let me say that again. In order for us to live in community with one another, we must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and we must be committed to long obedience in the same direction. These four things, they're not quick fixes. They don't change us immediately. They don't change the world overnight. What they do is invite us into the process of long obedience in the same direction. What direction? Jesus. Jesus is our direction. Jesus is our true north. And we are committed to a long journey towards Him. This is difficult. Impossible for so many of us because we prefer a microwavable spirituality. We want what we want and we want it now. 41 years ago, Eugene Peterson wrote his book, Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And he hit the nail on the head. Now at that time, he was talking about the church in the 1970s and 1980s. But he perfectly describes our spirituality in 2021. Eugene Peterson says this, One aspect of the world that I have been able to identify as harmful to Christians is the assumption that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. We assume that if something can be done at all, it can be done quickly and efficiently. Our attention spans have been conditioned by 30-second commercials. He goes on, Religion in our time has been captured by the tourist mindset. Religion is understood as a visit to an attractive site to be made when we have adequate leisure. We are living in the Twitter generation We are living in the Instagram stories generation. We are living in the Netflix generation where everything happens quickly in a blur and it never slows down for us to take a breath and process. And to be honest, this is exactly what we want. Which is why these platforms are so successful. We want fast. We want immediate. We want it right now. We don't want to wait. But let me say something that might feel jarring. This is not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is about the long haul. It's about endurance. It's about perseverance. It's about patience. It's about waiting. Eugene Peterson quotes Frederick Nietzsche who said, the essential thing in heaven and earth is that there should be long obedience in the same direction. And he goes on and says, something which has made life worth living. A life worth living, the life worth giving yourself to will always include long obedience in the same direction. And so, the early church devoted themselves They devoted themselves. They practiced long obedience in the direction of Jesus by studying the apostles' teaching, through fellowship with one another, by sharing meals together, and through prayer. They were able to operate in the messiness, the messiness of community, which if you read the rest of Acts, it's very messy. It's very turbulent. They were able to do that. Because they devoted themselves to long obedience in the same direction. And that direction was Jesus. And as they did that, my friends, they were transformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus. They looked more and more like Jesus. And this is what we want to invite you into at One Life. Not the immediate, not the quick fix, not the overnight success. We want to invite you into long obedience in the same direction. And we believe that this happens when you choose to live in community with other 
disciples of Jesus. We believe this happens when you practice the in circle, where you learn from one another, where you listen to one another, and where you love one another. This in circle, this is the place of sanctification, where we are transformed in the likeness of Jesus. And so as I started today, I want to end by inviting you to be a part of one of these communities. We're going to call them 242 groups, following the example of Acts 242. And we're going to have these groups in person and online. They're going to meet a couple times a month, every other week. You're going to get together with six, seven, eight people. You're going to study scripture. You're going to fellowship with one another. You're going to eat and drink together. You're going to pray for one another. Believing that as you do so, it will keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and that you will be practicing long obedience in the same direction and you will be transformed. And so we want to invite you into this. We want to invite you into this process of living in community with other disciples of Jesus. You can learn more by going to onelifehub.com slash 242 groups. There will be a link in the description and in the chat. We encourage you to go there, to fill out a quick form letting us know that you'd like to join us, join one of these groups, and then we will let you know at the beginning of September when these groups are going to launch. We're excited about this. We're excited to see all that God is going to do as we commit to long obedience in the same direction together. I want to read a benediction over us. If you are sitting in your living room, I want to invite you to stand and just take the posture of receiving, holding out your hands. If you're driving down the road, please don't do this. Keep your hands on the wheel. Right? If you're somewhere at work, just take a moment and just place your hands out like this. And let's receive the benediction that comes from 1 John chapter 4, verses 11 through 19. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because He first loved us.